So third lecture by Jesse. Great. Hey, good morning, everyone. So we're going to continue our discussion of QCD and collider physics by me giving you an introduction to jet physics. And uh, you're going to see that some of the themes that we've seen earlier in the previous lectures are going to show up here. And I'm going to try to give you at least some intuition about uh, jet formation before uh, giving you an example of a more explicit calculation that we can do in the next lecture. So last time, we made a kind of profound assertion that if I'm looking at the process of PP going to some number of hadrons, that it was possible to break this into pieces uh, in terms of a sum over partonic initial states. And we were able to do that with the help of parton distribution functions. Uh, going to a small number of partons times some branching ratios. And we stated the assumption under which this, uh, this was true, uh, that this was uh, uh, made sense in the context of the narrow width approximation. Um, and you know, just to emphasize, you know, this decomposition into PDFs and uh, uh, cross-sections of branching ratios is not obvious. And uh, in general, it's not true. But if we choose uh, appropriate observables, then it's true to a good approximation. And kind of crucial to this whole discussion, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, today, uh, is that whatever observable that I'm really measuring on the hadronic final state um, is approximately the same as the observable that I would measure just on the partons, but more specifically, the partons from the hard process. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by hard process. But there's kind of two different assumptions going on here that we're assuming um, insensitivity to certain dynamics, certain QCD dynamics. So we have insensitivity to, well, at the one level, uh, insensitivity to uh, non-perturbative hadronization. So we're going to, when we talk about a jet calculation, we're going to be imagining doing the jet measurement on hadrons, but doing the jet calculation on partons. And so we're assuming here that hadronization doesn't play that big of a role. And therefore, what I would measure on hadrons is approximately the same as what I would measure on partons. And I'll try to explain to you uh, a little bit later in this lecture why that's a sensible assumption. Um, and then the other non-perturbative effect uh, that we have to uh, take into account is non-perturbative underlying event. An underlying event is kind of a generic name for talking about the uh, additional uh, scattering dynamics of the garbage that doesn't go into the PDF. So when I pluck a quark out of the proton, of course, there's the remnant of the proton still left over. That can undergo uh, uh, collisions with the remnant of the other proton, and that can give rise to uh, what's called underlying event. And so when I'm saying that I can kind of ignore that underlying event, I'm basically saying that when I'm talking about partons, it's appropriate to be thinking about just the partons um, from the hard scattering and ignoring details of uh, some of the soft physics. And again, it's not obvious that that's true. And you have to make sure you choose your measurement in such a way that you're insensitive to some of these non-perturbative or soft physics effects. OK, so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about jets. And jets are the manifestation uh, in the infrared of short distance quarks and gluons. And kind of just more generally, what is a jet? Um, and well, jets are really two different things. So I'll come back to that in just a second. But you know, at a colloquial level, uh, jets are collimated sprays of hadrons. And at least uh, if I'm drawing cartoons, I can take each of the partons uh, in the standard model, and I can give you at least a cartoon picture for what type of jets that they form. Uh, so the partons that I'm going to care about are uh, gluon, down, up, strange, charm, bottom. And uh, the top quark is not in this game because the top quark decays before it has a chance to undergo uh, uh, jet formation. Um, but for each of these partons, they manifest themselves as a, a, a spray of particles. And that spray of particles is related in some way to the quantum numbers uh, that these partons are carrying. 
So jets coming from gluons down up and strange. This is going to give me some spray of particles, which I'm going to bundle using a jet algorithm into a single jet object. We'll come back to that in a second. And these are all quite challenging to distinguish from each other. Um, and the calculation that we're going to do uh, uh, next time, uh, next lecture, will be to try to tell the difference between uh, quark jets and uh, sorry, gluon jets and light quark jets. And so this is going to be in lecture four. And we'll talk about how one would do that distinguishing. But this is quite challenging. Um, these all kind of look roughly the same. <laughs> they look like a spray of, you know, on order, let's say, 10, 20 uh, particles, depending on exactly the uh, energy of the jet. So we have a parton. It initiates a shower. Um, and despite the fact that the mass of the parton is approximately zero, in the case of the gluon, it's exactly zero at the Lagrangian level, um, the jets that we're going to reconstruct, and I'll explain this a little bit more, the mass of the jet is not zero, and we'll try to understand that. And roughly speaking, just in your brain, you can think about it as like 10% of the jet energy. And so even though the partons are, to a good approximation, massless, the jets themselves have mass, and that's going to be uh, important. In the case of charm and bottom quarks, um, it's a little bit different uh, just because of the fact that, uh, as I mentioned in the first lecture, when I make charm and bottom uh, hadrons, uh, they often have a long lifetime uh, before they decay. And so from the collision point, charm and bottom hadrons formed from hadronization live for a long time before then decaying. There's still additional radiation that comes along for the ride, and we'll understand where that radiation is coming from. Um, but I get a jet that has a displaced vertex signature. The uh, detailed radiation pattern turns out to be different for an effect that's called the dead cone effect, which I'm not going to be talking about in these lectures. Um, but if you want to go and identify uh, charm or bottom produced in, in some process, uh, this displaced vertex signature is a good way of going about it. And the thing that I want to make sure, if nothing else you remember in this lecture, uh, uh, I want you to know the following, that jets are really two different things. Um, at the one level, jets are a physical phenomenon. Okay. This is an emergent feature of certain confining gauge theories that they make manifest the spray of particles. It's a physical phenomenon. No matter what measurement you make, this phenomenon goes on. But at the same time, uh, jets, at least the word jet, is used for analysis techniques. It's an analysis technique. A particular uh, way that we're going to assign bundles of hadrons and form a jet object. But this jet object that I make here versus the physical phenomena of jet formation, they're, they're distinct. Um, and there are certainly ways of studying jets that have nothing to do with running a jet algorithm. Um, and this is a choice that you as the analyst make. You get to choose your f observable. <laughs> That's your choice. For this physical phenomena, uh, to the best of our knowledge, we don't have any control over the Lagrangian. It's like coming from the Lagrangian of QCD. We don't have a way of adjusting that. You get to choose how you analyze the final state, but the particular patterns that you're getting, that is the amplitudes you're getting, uh, that have this jet formation uh, in it, uh, that's something that you don't get to control. Of course, these things go hand in hand. And the reason why we introduce jet algorithms is as a way of understanding better this jet formation pheno phenomena. OK, let me just pause for a moment to see if there's any questions about what I've said thus far or any leftover questions from last lecture. OK. So I want to now give you some intuition about why jets form at all, give you some intuition for the physical phenomena of jet formation.
So why do jets form? Um, and so let me give you three complementary ways of understanding why jets form. So one way of understanding why jets form uh, is because of the singular structure of QCD, and in particular the fact that QCD has soft and collinear singularities. And we're going to talk more about this later uh, in this lecture and certainly later next time. Um, but roughly speaking, if I'm looking at a jet formation process, so I have some scattering process, something happens, some number of particles come out. Um, let's say I pluck a, a quark out of that process, so some, some scattering process that gives me a quark. Um, and I look at that quark uh, splitting to, uh, to another quark and a gluon. You know, I'm trying to understand this process. This scattering process has a singularity when this propagator goes on shell. And just like in the narrow width approximation, when you saw that you had a heavy resonance going on shell and the amplitude simplified, at least in an appropriate approximation, here, when um, this propagator goes on shell, we're going to see that there is a factorization that occurs. And we will actually be able to split up this process into a scattering that produces this quark and a separate uh, splitting of that quark to a quark and a gluon. So more specifically, if I think that I have momentum p that I start with and then it goes to p1 and p2, um, there, uh, where, where uh, p is equal to p1 plus p2, there's a singularity uh, when p squared uh, approaches 0 because that's when this uh, propagator goes on shell. Here I'm imagining that the quarks are massless. Um, and I'm also going to imagine that, uh, that the partons that splitting to are massless, so p1 squared is 0 and p2 squared is 0. And now you can just ask, in which kinematic configurations do I get the singularity? In which kinematic configurations do I see an enhancement of this amplitude? So when does uh, p squared equal to 0? And you can convince yourself um, that there's uh, two limits that uh, certainly this, this propagator would go on shell. So one of them is the collinear limit. And that's when the momentum of, of this P1 is parallel to the momentum of P2. And so there's a, a singularity, an enhancement, for when I have a parton for it to split into two that are going exactly in the same direction. And because of that collinear singularity, that's the reason why jets, when I form them, they want to be collimated. They want to be collimated because the amplitude tells you that there's a higher probability for those partons to be produced from this process to be produced in the same direction. So this is the reason why uh, jets form. That's the physical pro phenomena. At least perturbatively, I can understand it from, from that. There's another limit, um, which is the so-called soft limit. Um, and that's when um, the momentum of, let's say, P2, this gluon, uh, when this momentum just goes to zero. When this momentum goes to zero, there's not particularly any uh, uh, preferred orientation. Um, and so this is, uh, more than anything else, just an annoyance that in any process that you have that involves colored particles, uh, you're going to have gluon emission soft gluon emission, in the same way that any process that you have involving charged particles, just, you just have photons emitted all over the place. Um, and this is an annoyance for precision jet physics. Um, and I can talk about more later if you're interested. Um, but in terms of why it's collimated, uh, it's collimated because of this collinear limit. And when we do our calculation in next lecture, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take the soft and collinear limit, uh, because that's a limit where it's easiest to do uh, calculations. And Something that I want to emphasize about jet formation is that this is perturbative. This has nothing to do with the fact that QCD confines or anything like that. This tendency to form collimated sprays is true of any gauge theory. And in, indeed, it's even true of QED. So if you, strictly speaking, if you have an electron going in some direction, the photons will want to go uh, collimated with the direction that, the, that electron went. 
Um, and so the dominant jet formation process is actually one that's first is perturbative, and therefore we have a chance of, uh, of, of uh, calculating it. And it happens basically with any, with any gauge theory, at least any theory that has collinear singularities. OK, so that's one reason why jets form. So another reason why jets form um, is, so let me just pause for a second to see if there's any, any questions about this. Yes? So, so part of it is, so the, so the question was, why do I need something like lattice QCD if I want to study something like, like jet fragmentation um, or, or PDFs? So there's some aspect of the, of the process which is perturbative. But the detailed structure is definitely non-perturbative. So if we're lucky, we'll, we'll, we'll choose observables um, that are uh, uh, relatively insensitive to that hadronization process. But strictly speaking, I need to account for that. Um, for some of the processes that uh, I'm talking about, we don't even know how to do those calculations on the lattice. So for something like parton distribution functions, there we have a way of gaining access on the lattice using current techniques and even techniques that are currently in development. For things like jet fragmentation, uh, this actually we don't currently have non-perturbative techniques to do those, uh, 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 those, those calculations. Um, but the point you're making is the correct one. This is a perturbative phenomena. And therefore, we can understand the dominant features of jet formation without ever appealing to non-perturbative dynamics, yeah. which is a good thing. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll try to convince you uh, uh, in a few minutes that it's not guaranteed, that it's special to QCD in some way. Yeah. So, so what, what, do you, what do you, so, so the, the question is when I'm having collinear, which things are aligned? Yeah. Well, so, so if, yeah, so, so good. In the collinear limit, P1, P2, and P, they're all in the same direction, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yes. So, so I, I'm not sure what, what, why, what, what you're saying is different than what I'm saying. So can you just try to say one more time? So, sorry. So, um, there's a collinear singularity when P1 and P2 are in the same direction. You agree? Uh, I would say when P1 and P and P2 and P are in the same direction. Right. So P1 and P2 are in the same direction, but it's just a function. Um, I mean, th these are all equivalent, right? So, so because of this summation, these are all the same statement. Now, if you're asking like more formally, it depends a little bit on whether you're like a deglap person <laughs> or whether you're uh, a, a jet shower person. Um, so if you're doing deglap evolution, we often think about ignoring this emission. So we're often talking about collinear emissions where we're integrating over that. And in fact, we can have multiple emissions. Um, and when you do high order deglap, um, you kind of ignore uh, uh, maybe not just one, but multiple partons. And so there it makes more sense to talk about the alignment of P1 with P. But when you're thinking about jet formation and where I'm really keeping track of everything that's happening there, it's often more convenient to think about the opening angle between these objects in contrast to the uh, angle between these. That said, um, actually, uh, some work that I've done um, in terms of jet algorithms has been related to exactly the difference between thinking about this type of angle versus the angle with respect to P. And there's effects called soft recoil effects, um, which are complicated, where it actually does make sense to think about the alignment to this P and not just the angle between these two. But in this limit, <laughs> by, by energy momentum conservation, these things being parallel implies that it's also Parallel to P. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
the rest of the ring of the clock. So this means the clock will decay to a, another clock that moves along. This is the value to the energy conservation value. So there's, a, there's, there's um, a couple of things you're saying. So first of all, when you account for uh, quark masses, then the mass of the quark regulates the propagator and regulates this collinear divergence. So this uh, collinear uh, limit uh, makes sense when the energy of the parton is large compared to the, to the quark mass. And then you could say, wait, but can't I do a Lorentz boost into, a, into a, an appropriate frame? And why don't I just work in the rest frame of the quark? Um, but if you're working in the rest frame of the quark and you go to the quark on shell, then it can't do anything. It can't decay at all. So here, this uh, propagator line here is, is, is off shell. And when I'm talking about the uh, momentum of that uh, object, I'm thinking about the relative momentum of this object with respect to the rest of the event, such that the appropriate rest frame that I'm talking about is really the rest frame for some uh, approximate color singlet uh, object that I'm studying. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. So, so there is no, there is, it is impossible for a particle to decay to itself and emitting something else if everything's on shell. So things are off shell, so I'm approaching this limit. So that's, so that's, let me draw this, I'm approaching this limit. But of course, this is a virtual quark. It's not on shell. And then when I'm talking about the relative energy, um, and I'm thinking about energies that are large compared to the mass, so I'm thinking about energies large compared to the mass of the quark, here, you would say, well, what frame am I thinking about? And I'm thinking about the frame in which this color triplet is color connected to some anti-triplet somewhere else in the event. And that's the kind of the, the, the scale that tells me what energy I should be thinking about. Other questions? OK. So um, another reason why jets form, at least why, why jets are, are something that we can study in perturbation theory, uh, is because of asymptotic freedom. Um, that is that alpha s is small uh, at uh, high enough uh, uh, effective center mass collision energy. Um, in, in particular, just to, to, to say what I, I said um, in the first lecture, um, that uh, asymptotic freedom um, uh, means that, for example, at the scale of mz, if I'm making jets at the scale of mz, actually, it's a pretty perturbative phenomena here. Um, and this is important because even if I have these soft and collinear singularities, and particularly these collinear singularities, um, it's kind of essential that I don't have too many of them. So if I have a quark, and that quark's emitting some number of gluons, that each one of these emissions carries with it an alpha s factor. And so there aren't so many emissions, and therefore the collimation that I have for each individual emission is maintained, and the jet basically goes in the same direction. Versus, even if I have these collinear uh, singularities, but alpha s is sufficiently big, then if I have a quark here, then this quark is going to radiate like crazy. Um, it's going to radiate a gluon. Um, it's going to radiate another gluon. It's going to keep radiating gluons because there's no suppression uh, for this to happen. Um, and uh, uh, moreover, um, uh, each one of these gluons could subsequently split. And we have more splitting and more splitting and more splitting and more splitting. And if there's really no alpha S suppression, uh, then you don't get a collimated spray of particles. You get something that's more uniformly distributed. So for a strongly coupled theory, if it's strongly coupled over a large range of scales, you end up getting kind of spherical uh, events uh, as opposed to collimated jet formation. And so I'll draw another cartoon of that uh, a little bit later. Um, but you know, even when you have these, these enhancements, uh, these enhancements can get completely uh, uh, washed out uh, if you just have so many emissions that you just fill up the whole phase space. And then finally, um, the key to why this perturbative description of jets uh, matches at all um, with what we measure on hadrons 
there's, a, there's an important fact about, uh, about the non-perturbative dynamics of QCD that we have to uh, evoke. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's that color strings break. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So let's just imagine that someone hands me a static quark, and it's just sitting there, and a static uh, anti-quark just sitting there. And let's say I was trying to do kind of a semi-classical uh, picture, like trying to draw the Coulomb fields, the field lines between uh, this quark and this, uh, this anti-quark. Um, and if I just you know, hold these things there, um, you'll have uh, kind of uh, field lines, gluon field lines, uh, that will uh, kind of look like the following. Uh, just like in electromagnetism, when you have a charge and, uh, and an opposite charge, you have uh, electric field lines that connect one to the other. Um, the difference with QCD, though, is that because QCD is confining, these field lines can't go off to infinity. Um, and rather, the, the nonlinear structure of QCD allows those field lines to kind of bend back on themselves. So that's fine. <laughs> we have uh, confining gluon flux. Um, what does that have to do with jets? So now let's just say I take this, 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 this Q and this Q bar, and let's say I start to pull them farther apart from each other and ask what's going to happen. So it could be, we could be in a theory where as you pull this apart, all you get is a linear confining tube of gluon flux that goes between them. And as I start pulling them farther and farther and farther apart, uh, you would find that 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 color flux tube just gets longer and longer and longer and longer. And this would give rise to what's called linear confinement. But that's not what happens in, in QCD. As you pull this apart, the energy density that's stored in this flux tube eventually gets big enough that it becomes energy, energetically favorable to pop a quark antiquark out of the vacuum. So we have these color flux lines. And you, you might think that. Uh, these uh, would just keep making a, a tube as you pull these farther and farther apart. But eventually you hit a point where energetically you'd rather pop um, uh, an anti-quark and a quark out of the vacuum such that these color lines now get some place new to end. And this is what we call string breaking. And now, as you start to continue to pull this Q and, and Q prime further and further apart, there's no tension anymore holding them together. If color strings didn't break, then you would get crazy configurations of just extended uh, flux tubes with maybe excitations along those flux tubes. But because the color strings break, and they break relatively easily, uh, the reason why they break relatively easily is that the mass of the up and the mass of the down quarks are, are small compared to lambda QCD. So that means it's relatively cheap to pop up and down, even to some extent strange quarks are easy to pop out of the vacuum. And that means that if I have now not the static configuration, but a dynamic configuration where I'm making these quarks in a jet process and I'm pulling them apart, this color string is very easy to se sever. And that means that the direction that these uh, partons are going to go and the direction that the subsequent uh, jets that I see will go are basically the same because it's very easy to break this rubber band uh, between the quarks. And so this picture, uh, uh, this cartoon, explains a lot. Um, so the fact that strings break easily um, that tells you that when I have uh, a hard quark or gluon, so a highly energetic uh, quark or gluon, that the direction that that hard quark or gluon is going is roughly speaking the same as the direction uh, of, the, of the jet that it produces of particles. If this severing didn't happen, or it happened um, uh, uh, less efficiently, then there would be kind of like a restoring force that was trying to pull on these partons and keep the direction of the hard quark and gluon from going in the direction that the jet goes. Um, uh, this picture also helps explain some other phenomena. Um, so these uh, gluonic fields carry energy. So this string, or the color flux tube, 
uh, carries uh, or has energy density. Uh, and because there's uh, energy stored uh, in this gluonic field, that explains why even if you have at the Lagrangian level a massless gluon or an approximately massless quark, um, that the jet that you form is massive. That is a spray of radiation that you get. Um, the mass that it has includes some contribution from this, uh, this, this flux tube. Um, this is also something that you can calculate perturbatively, by the way. Um, and so, as we'll as we'll see, um, uh, the the mass squared uh, of a jet uh, scales roughly like alpha s, the radius parameter that I'm using, and then the energy of that jet squared. There's some other things that we can uh, uh, learn from this. Uh, so we can learn uh, that the fact that the string is severed by uh, quark anti-quark pairs. That's the easiest way of breaking these flux tubes. This explains why jets are mostly mesons. We don't get that many baryons. And so if I just take a typical jet, um, uh, then uh, a typical jet will be something like 80% uh, built out of pi plus minus pi naught, because these are built out of the lightest up and down quarks. You get roughly 15% that's made out of kaons, and then 5% you know, of everything else, roughly. And so the fact that jets are dominantly made by pions and kaons, and that's why when I'm talking about jets, I often talk about a spray of pions and kaons. It's because the easiest thing to keep popping out are QQ bar pairs. And then when you reassemble those QQ bar pairs, you end up getting QQ bar bound states, namely mesons. And there's one other fact um, which, uh, which is important, um, is that uh, the string uh, is itself, this whole object, is a color singlet. Um, and that means that jets, at some level, are fundamentally ambiguous. So I can't just talk about the jet produced by this Q, or the jet produced by this Q bar. They're connected by gluon flux. And again, even when I sever it, like exactly where I sever it is going to be ambiguous. And so you basically have this mismatch between the fact that the jets that I'm studying, you know, they're built out of color triplet quarks and color octet gluons. But at the end of the day, I see color singlet hadrons. And that mismatch between colored objects that are initiating my jet versus color singlet objects that I'm actually seeing in my, in my events, that means that there's a fundamental ambiguity that I have to deal with. Um, and that means that there's always an intrinsic level of non-perturbative dynamics that I have to uh, account for um, when uh, thinking about jets just from the fact that I'm trying to make calculations on color carrying objects, even though my measurement is made on color singlet objects. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> well, we haven't talked about it yet, but this you get to choose as a user. So as a user, you get to decide what, what do you mean by a jet? It, it's, it's some overall angular extent. So in this picture here, I decide that I have a scale R in which I call things inside or outside my jet. And now uh, I take that scale R and I'd say, OK, these are inside. This one is outside. And it's ambiguous where I draw that line. But roughly speaking, uh, the, the, the jet scales in that, the jet mass scales in that way. So the more wide angle radiation I, I include, the bigger the mass uh, will be. The energy of the jet is like the energy of this overall spray. Yeah. Well, we'll come back to that more um, later on. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 I didn't hear what they said. The, oh, the Reggie trajectory? Yeah. Um, they must be related in some way, yeah. I mean, th this is a little bit something that I'm doing on, on dimensional analysis, um, but uh, 
I have to think about the, the, the exact uh, correlation. It's a different limit of QCD, but they must be related in some way. Okay, other questions? Okay, so the thing that I want to emphasize as the kind of the, um, the last kind of cartoony picture um, that I draw is that um, jets are not automatic. And you have to think carefully about whether the theory that you're studying actually creates jets or not. So jets are not automatic. And one way we can talk about jets not being automatic is imagine imaginary worlds um, uh, that have different properties from QCD. Um, so one example of an imaginary world uh, is uh, what's been dubbed the quirky world. Instead of a world of quarks, you have a world of quirks. Um, and the quirky world is uh, a world uh, in, in the language of, of QCD uh, would be like having QCD but only top quarks. So what would that world look like? So imagine that I'm slamming together, let's do an easier case, I'm doing electron-positron collisions and then via the electromagnetic or the, or the weak forces, let's say I make a top quark recoiling against an anti-top and now I ask what does this world look like? So perturbatively, E plus E minus goes to TT bar. But I have to remember that there's a color flux tube that basically connects the anti-top to the top. And if I only have top quarks, though, then, and assuming that uh, uh, the mass of, of top is much, much bigger than lambda QCD, then it's never energetically favorable to sever this color flux tube by a TT bar pair. And so the only thing that can happen is I can, might be able to spit off some uh, glue balls. So these are glue balls. But as I start cranking more and more and more energy uh, into this TT bar pair, I just get a more complicated uh, 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 flux tube configuration. Um, and so I get you know, excited flux tubes. And so this theory does not form jets. This theory forms bound states, toponium bound states, and a, and a huge spectrum of toponium bound states, um, uh, and, uh, and, and glue balls. And because this rubber band that's connecting the T and the T bar is, is, uh, doesn't want to sever, this means that the direction that the top is going and the anti-top is going has nothing to do with the overall radiation pattern that I see at the end of the day. So in this quirky world, even if I thought that this was perturbative dynamics that was creating the top anti-top pair, because I can't sever color flux tubes, because I don't have light up and down quark uh, uh, around, uh, then I just get something that has nothing to do with, uh, with, with jet formation. Uh, here's another hypothetical world that I can imagine. I can imagine living in a strongly coupled quasi-conformal world. So this would be a case where the beta function is close to zero um, and, uh, and the, the, the coupling constant is you know, pushing the balance of perturbativity. And in this world, there's a huge range of energy scales over which the theory is strongly coupled. And because there's a huge range of scales over which the theory is strongly coupled, that means that if I do the same thing of making E plus E minus pairs, now even if I do have light quarks in the game, so let's say I make you know, some light quark, uh, uh, anti-quark, I can just have so many gluon emissions, you know, basically gluons being emitted in every direction, uh, not constrained at all by perturbation theory, 
uh, at all scales, I get gluon emissions. You know, this is something where a Feynman diagrammatic approach doesn't converge very well at all. And yeah, maybe eventually it's only quasi-conformal, so maybe eventually it confines. And at the end of the day, I get a bunch of pions. Because there's no hierarchies of scales, there's no characteristic size that I expect these, these, these uh, uh, pions to be confined in. Um, and so our best guess um, is that most likely um, the, uh, the radiation patterns that I get from this type of process are spherical. So I get spherical uh, radiation patterns. And uh, I don't get collimated jets. Or at least if there is any collimation from the coming, coming from the collinear singularity, it's washed out by the soft gluon emission. So we are lucky. <laughs> we are lucky that our world uh, is not either one of these crazy worlds. Um, well, jets are a phenomena that are happening at high scales, and so a C or a B quark jet at energies above the C or the B quark mass end up looking a lot like light quark jets, with just a little bit of a difference from this dead cone effect and from the fact that when it hadronizes, it ends up making a heavy flavored meson. But actually, in terms of, I don't want to say it's more fundamental. Uh, 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 light quark uh, uh, hadrons. Yeah. But, but the same is actually true of B quark jets. The B quark jets, apart from the fact that you have a B in it, uh, the rest of the radiation pattern is, again, coming from the string breaking. And eventually, if you get to high enough scales, actually, you get into a situation where, let's say, you're making a gluon jet at a very high scale. That gluon jet can actually split to a BB bar. And then, actually, gluons can manifest themselves as still having heavy flavor mesons inside of them, because eventually, all the quarks are treated democratically. And so at high enough energies, you would get roughly equal numbers of up, down, strange, char, and bottom. And if you go to really high energies, you'll even start getting equal numbers of TT bar uh, being produced. So I wouldn't say that it's more fundamental. If you didn't have flavor tagging, yeah. Just, just we are the jet algorithm. Yeah. The yeah. Would, you, would you tell that, OK, this is a, a very different looking jet compared to the If you didn't have the if you good, so, so, so the question was: um, Imagine that I didn't have the heavy flavor tag, and I didn't have the displaced vertex. Can I tell the difference um, between light quark flavors and heavy quark flavor jets? And the answer is yes, you can because of this uh, dead cone effect, this suppression of the collinear singularity. Um, and I, and I've even written a paper about trying to do that, but it's very subtle, um, and it's not so easy to do that distinguishing. And um, uh, it is it, there in principle, but it ends up getting fairly washed out by the fact that the other processes in jet formation end up filling up the, this dead cone region that's from the suppression of the collinear singularity. Can you elaborate? So who, who's who's? Can you elaborate? elaborate on what? What you just mentioned. About what I just mentioned about, about the dead cone? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so. Uh, if you have a B quark, and I want to look at the radiation pattern of, of gluons coming off that B quark, there's kind of a characteristic scale here um, that's related to the B quark mass, so kind of a, 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 a dead cone region uh, that's, uh, I forget how the scaling is, but something like MB uh, over the, the energy of the jet, where I have a suppression of gluon radiation inside of that range. And so this is a way that you can try to tell uh, whether you get have a heavy quark or, or a light quark by whether there's a suppression of radiation in this dead cone region. The challenge is that this gluon can then subsequently radiate, uh, perhaps back into the dead cone region. And so even though this primary emission uh, would be suppressed, if there's a secondary emission that ends up filling in that region, it ends up being quite difficult to distinguish um, in practice. OK, so our world, the world
world that we live in is a world that has jets. The number of colors is three. The number of flavors, depending on your scale, is somewhere between two and five or six if you're at super high energies. And we have collinear singularities. So that explains jet formation. There's another thing that ends up giving uh, another source of collimation, which is uh, called color coherence, which I'm not going to be talking about. But this also basically tells you that radiation kind of wants to continue to be aligned in the direction that it's produced. Um, we have asymptotic freedom. Um, so that means that uh, we can do perturbative calculations at high scales. Ultimately, the theory is confining, um, which could create problems, for example, in this case, but uh, our color strings break. And therefore, the direction of the energy flows uh, uh, are the direction of the energy flows of partons and the energy flow of hadrons are roughly similar. So now the picture that you should have in your brain is that you make this quark, you make this antiquark, you have some amount of perturbative radiation collinearly enhanced so that the radiation tends to go into a jet region. And inside of these jets, you get mostly mesons. You have additional soft radiation, which will create additional uh, you know, things uh, coming out of your event you know, at, at, at all angles. So these are, these are soft complications. Um, but the feature that we're going to be studying more is studying this, uh, this collimated jet. And that jet collimation is happening again because of these, these regions, reasons stated here. And again, uh, just to, to, to say it again, this radiation formation, the fact that I get this collimated spray of particles Ignoring this non perturbative complication, that's a perturbative phenomena. That's why I have a chance of doing a calculation in the next lecture. OK, any further questions before we move on? OK, so the thing that I want to uh, move on to next is I want to move on to um, studying the consequences of this uh, soft collinear factorization or this collinear factorization and the fact that um, when you have propagators that go on shell, you can basically split up um, your scattering process in terms of a hard scattering process and then additional uh, radiation being formed. And uh, in particular, we're going to be talking about initial state uh, and final state radiation. And we're going to be talking a lot more about final state radiation in the, in the next lecture, but let's, let's talk about initial state radiation here. And we can, we can learn a lot about collider physics just by thinking about initial state radiation. And as a warm up, let's go to the process uh, of, of Higgs boson production. Let's say Higgs boson production uh, via top quark loop. And ask what happens uh, if, in addition, I have an additional radiated gluon. And of course, this additional radiated gluon uh, will eventually fragment and, uh, and form a jet. So one of the leading Feynman diagrams for, for this process of glue and something going to Higgs and glue uh, is where I have a gluon that um, uh, uh, splits in this way. So I have glue glue going to Higgs glue via top quark loop. And then I have a gluon here. And let's say I have momentum P flowing through that gluon. Uh, here we have a propagator associated with that gluon. And that propagator, if I want to look at kind of the dominant contribution to this process, I need to look at where that propagator uh, blows up. And of course, that propagator blows up. Um, uh, when this p goes to zero. So this propagator scales like 1 over p squared. 
And so I want to look at the regions of phase space where p is close to zero. That is, there's very little uh, 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 momentum flowing through this, uh, through this object. Or just this propagator uh, goes on shell. And as we argued, this can happen in two regimes. It can happen in the soft regime. And that soft regime corresponds to this uh, gluon being emitted carrying very little energy. Or it can uh, uh, happen in the collinear regime. And the collinear regime is where this incoming gluon and this outgoing gluon are going in the same direction. And this is the comment that I was mentioning before, that if you're thinking about deglap evolution and you're thinking about what's splitting, it's often more convenient instead of talking about these things being parallel as having the initial and the final being parallel. And so we have a gluon coming in. It emits a gluon that goes into the hard scattering process, but then the rest of the radiation uh, would come out. And these two uh, directions uh, uh, will we'll end up being uh, parallel to each other. And um, uh, that uh, plays a role in the way that we would think about uh, the dynamics of initial state radiation. So this is called initial state radiation because uh, this is happening off of the initial state. So this is called ISR. So just like we saw for the narrow width approximation uh, last lecture, there's a simplification that happens when this thing goes close to on shell. In particular, a lot of the various interference diagrams are kind of irrelevant, and we can just think about a semi-classical process of this gluon splitting uh, into a glue-glue, one gluon going in and the other gluon going out. Um, and that gives rise to factorization of this initial state radiation process from this other hard scattering process. And repeating what I've been saying over and over again in these lectures, whether that factorization is appropriate or not depends on the observable that you're measuring. Um, and in particular, you have to ask the question, are you inclusive over what this thing is doing? In which case, you get DGLAP evolution. Um, do you measure very, in very detail uh, what this ISR radiation is doing? Are you making such a detailed measurement that actually you have to worry about the color correlations between this jet and the rest of the, uh, the, uh, the remnants of the proton? So th th there's a detailed question. But let's put that de those details aside and just ask for this gluon emission, which direction is it going and, uh, and what does that look like uh, in your detector? OK, so let's put some equations to this. And uh, for those of you who uh, will, will need an exam at the end of this course, uh, <laughs> This is one of the exercises that I will, that I will assign to. Um, to show the following, show that in the soft and collinear limit, that the following is approximately true. And this is going to be the analog of the narrow width approximation that we did last time, but now in the context of, uh, of, of jet formation. So. Okay, we have some sum over polarizations, which you can figure out the details of what I mean by that. We're going to have an integral over n plus 1 body phase space. We're going to have some scattering process, which I'll draw schematically as I had before, where I have a quark uh, going to a quark and a gluon. And there's a similar process uh, that I could have if I had, uh, instead of a, a, a gluon, going to a gluon and a gluon. And then you should ask me why I'm not thinking about a gluon going to a quark antiquark. That's a good question that someone should ask. Um, and here's the exercise you have to show. That you have to show that in the simultaneous soft and collinear limits, at this, OK, there's, again, some, some of our polarization details, that this factorizes into an integral over n body phase space where I just have this quark coming out times um, the following uh, integral. So uh, uh, 
dz, I'll explain what these kinematics are in a second, uh, d theta, and I guess in my notes I forgot to put in uh, d phi. Um, of the following quantity. So 2 times alpha s over pi cf 1 over z 1 over theta. So I need to unpack that formula for you for a moment. In a moment. Okay, so if you remember, for phase space, if I am integrating over n plus 1 objects, this has three more degrees of freedom than if I just have n objects. For each object that I add for Lorentz invariant n body phase space, I have three. Uh, integrations to do. So I have n. To get to n plus 1, I need three things. And my three variables are z, theta, and phi. So what are z, theta, and phi? So I have my quark. Uh, my quark uh, uh, emits a gluon and a quark. And z is the momentum fraction that's carried by the gluon such that the momentum fraction carried by the quark is 1 minus c. So z is a fraction. So we have an energy fraction, z, which is basically the energy uh, of, the, uh, of the emitted gluon compared to the energy of the initial state. We have a splitting angle, theta. Um, And that angle theta um, is basically just the angle between the, uh, the, the, the quark and, uh, and, uh, and the gluon. And we would get a similar answer if we talked about the, the angle between the, uh, uh, either the final or the initial. It doesn't really matter uh, for the purposes of this formula. Um, and then we have an azimuthal angle. Phi. And that phi is the angle that this gluon would be emitted uh, are around the uh, around the quark axis. Okay. So the amount of momentum that can carry by one versus the other that goes between zero and one. The angle goes between zero and some maximum value where actually the parton that you emit is ends up being closer to other partons and not to the one that's doing the emission. Phi, of course, goes from zero to two pi. And this emission probability uh, has this interesting form. Um, it depends on OK, there's 2 over pi. Uh, but there's a factor of alpha s. And that alpha s is coming from the fact that this is g strong. Uh, that thing gets squared. g strong squared divided by 4 pi. That's alpha s. So that's why you get an alpha s appearing here. Cf is a color factor. I'll define what that is in just a moment. And then the key, and the key for this exercise, uh, is to show that this emission goes like 1 over z. What does that mean? This thing is dominated by z being close to zero. The largest probability is when this thing is goes singular. So this is the soft uh, this is the soft singularity, where this emitted gluon wants to have low energy, and this theta, uh, that is the collinear singularity, saying that the emission probability is dominated by when um, uh, when the quark and the gluon are aligned with each other. And you get two singularities if you have both soft and collinear. And that's the calculation that we're going to do next time is, is doing this in the soft and collinear limits. So let me keep unpacking some of that expression. Um, we have these color factors. Um, which are different depending on whether I have a quark that's doing emitting or a gluon doing the emitting. So the diagram I drew here was with a quark emitting a gluon. This is a quark that emits a quark and a soft gluon. Or that diagram at the top there, which is a gluon. Let me just put a subscript soft there. Uh, a gluon emitting a gluon and a soft gluon. 
And if you just look at the uh, Feynman rules that I wrote down in the first lecture, and you kind of convince yourself that uh, that diagram is proportional to uh, the following. So we take the, um, the uh, representation of the SC3 algebra uh, in the triplet representation. And you have to sew together uh, uh, indices in this way. And then you get a coefficient that's CF. And the same kind of group theory factors uh, that you have for the octet are tied together in this way. And so basically, the diagram is proportional to some kind of group theory factor. And what are those group theory factors? Um, so these group theory factors uh, for uh, a general SUNC gauge theory, uh, the uh, value of CF is NC squared minus 1 over 2NC, uh, which for the case of NC equals 3 is 4 thirds. So just like electrons have charge 1, <laughs> There's a sense in which quarks have color charge four-thirds. And then the CA, so F is for fundamental, A is for adjoint. So CA is equal to NC. And again, if I go to the, um, to the NC equals three case, I have three. Uh, three uh, is bigger than four-thirds. If that's not obvious to you, three is the same thing as nine-thirds. And nine is bigger than four. And roughly speaking, uh, 9 is approximately equal to 4 times 2. And so roughly speaking, gluons have twice the charge of, of quarks. And uh, if this looks goofy to you, uh, uh, it's less goofy if you go to the large NC limit. So in the large NC limit, this minus 1 doesn't matter. And you see that, it, that actually you get a factor of 2, that in the large NC limit, it really is true that adjoints are, are twice as colorful as, as fundamentals. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a reasonable approximation. Um, so I just want to emphasize what this means. What, what this formula means is that if I'm trying to study a scattering process that gives me n plus 1 partons in the final state, it is well approximated by considering just n partons in the final state, and then one of those n partons splitting in two, dominated by that splitting giving me, a, giving me a soft gluon going in the same direction as the emitter. And the degree to which I have a propensity for having that emission depends on the strength of my theory, that's alpha s, and it depends on whether my emitter is a, is, a, is a quark or a gluon or maybe some other color representation if we want to look at an exotic theory. OK, so from this, we already can tell us, learn a lot about the question that I, that I started off uh, uh, before doing that exercise for you to do, uh, is to talk about initial state radiation Higgs production. We can use this formula uh, to try to, to understand that process of initial state radiation. Well, let me just pause for a second to see if there's any, any questions here. But this is kind of the equivalent of the narrow width approximation, that in the singular limit, I have a simplification of the, uh, of the structure of the amplitude into a product of producing n partons, and then the, uh, times the probability that one parton splits into. OK, so let's return to initial state radiation Higgs boson production. So we have our protons colliding. It makes a Higgs boson. That Higgs boson decays to two photons. And there could be initial state radiation. Which way does the initial state radiation go? Well, by this formula, it wants to go in the same direction as the emitters. The, the photons don't carry color. So the color is being carried by the gluons that are uh, inside the proton that are coming into the collision. And so the radiation wants to go in the direction of the initial beam. So I'm going to have initial state radiation from this guy going 
along the direction the beam is going, initial state radiation for this guy, going along the direction the other beam is going. And the approximate uh, angular distribution if I call this angle to the beam line theta, it approximately goes like d theta over theta near theta is equal to zero. That's just this d theta over theta from this formula here. But also there's uh, another regime at theta equals, uh, a pi, uh, theta equals pi, so near theta equals pi, um, where the radiation uh, gets collimated near pi, and so it goes like d theta over pi minus theta. And it's a little bit annoying to keep track of those things separately, so let me just do an approximation that works in both limits. Let me uh, use a, 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 a formula uh, that works both near zero and near pi, where I have the singularities. Let's talk about d theta over sine theta. So sine theta in the vicinity of theta equals zero goes like theta. Sine theta in the vicinity of uh, pi goes like pi minus theta. And so the distribution of this radiation goes inversely with sine theta. So it's peaked near the beams with a uh, suppressed radiation pattern uh, in the center. That's the distribution of ISR. Now, this peaking behavior of uh, initial state radiation is annoying. So it's annoying for theory calculations because you have to keep track of the sine theta. But imagine you're an experimentalist and you're trying to build a detector and you want your detector to you know, last for a long time. And now I'm telling you that the radiation that I'm getting you is dominant in the forward uh, directions. Then you say, well, that's really annoying. I need to build a detector that can withstand more radiation in the beam direction compared to the central direction. And you would much prefer to build a detector that was in some sense uniform or got uniform acceptance uh, to all the possible radiation patterns. So here I'm doing initial state radiation in Higgs production, uh, but this is also true for um, uh, even garden variety proton-proton um, uh, uh, -proton collisions that they end up having radiation that's distributed roughly like this. And this is annoying. It's annoying to be carrying around this uh, 1 over sine theta factor. So wouldn't it be better if we worked in the coordinate system where radiation was more uniform? So this is one of the reasons why when we're doing uh, uh, analyses at Hadron Colliders, where again, your beams are colored, so you're going to have this initial state radiation phenomenon, among other things, um, it's really convenient to do a change of variables. A change of variables um, to remove that 1 over sine theta behavior. And so there's a quantity that um, many of you probably know about that's called pseudorapidity. And pseudorapidity minus log tangent of theta over 2. If you ever confused why anyone would talk about the pseudorapidity in terms of this log tangent, like why were they doing it that? Well, among other things, one of the reasons why you would make that change of variables is because with this change of variables, um, the measure for pseudorapidity is indeed uh, the measure that you would use for, um, for uh, this radiation pattern. So pseudorapidity uh, is the coordinate system where initial state radiation happens uniformly. And so the reason, or one of the reasons why we build our detector is using pseudorapidity as a coordinate is that in that coordinate system, ISR is more or less uniformly distributed. Um, there's a slight subtlety um, for, uh, for massive particles. Uh, it turns out to be more convenient to use true rapidity, which agrees with this formula in the massless limit. So all the pictures that I'm going to be drawing in a second are based on this uh, true rapidity, where you take the energy of the particle uh, and relate it to the, to the z component of the momentum, where z is the, the direction of the beamline. But 
putting that subtlety to, uh, aside, this is the thing that you should be thinking about. And when you hear pseudo-rapidity, you should be thinking about, oh yes, I'm, I'm moving to a coordinate system where at least certain QCD dynamics become uniform. And this fact explains the funny coordinate system that people who work in proton-proton collisions the funny coordinates that we use, um, that even though when I was talking about Lorentz invariant phase space, I was talking about energy, momentum, and the x, y, and z components, we tend not to use those when we're describing hadron collisions. We tend to talk about transverse momentum, that is transverse with respect to the beam line. Uh, we talk about rapidity, we talk about azimuth, and we also talk about the mass of particles. Uh, the conversion uh, between these is relatively straightforward. Um, that if I want to know the energy, I take the combination of transverse momentum and mass, multiply it by the hyperbolic cosine of y. Px and Py are related to transverse momentum with this azimuth angle. I'll draw another picture of this in a moment. Um, and then the z component looks just like the energy component. But instead of hyperbolic cosine, it's a hyperbolic sine. And this coordinate system has a number of nice, nice features. Um, so uh, this coordinate system uh, has various uh, 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 invariances, so nice features. Again, I'll draw a picture in a moment. That this transverse momentum is something that is invariant to uh, boosts in the z direction, that is boosts along the beam line. And uh, uh, as is differences of rapidity. And, but the thing that I want to emphasize based on this calculation up here, that QCD radiation is roughly uniform um, in this rapidity azimuth plane. Okay, so I promise you some pictures. Let me draw some pictures for you. So if I have my, my proton beam coming in here, my other proton beam coming in here, that, uh, let's say this one's at theta equals zero. What does theta equals zero mean in terms of that, uh, uh, that pseudo rapidity? Well, if I put theta equals zero tangent of zero minus log of that, that gives me basically infinity. So infinite rapidity uh, is uh, theta equals zero. So, there's a singularity. When I say there's a singularity, uh, it was a d theta over sine theta. Sine theta blows up at theta equals zero, and that's done here by the fact that rapidity goes all the way off to uh, infinity. And in this direction over here, theta equals minus pi. So theta equals pi, uh, rapidity goes to minus infinity. Um, if I'm at 90 degrees, so theta is 90 degrees, that corresponds to rapidity equals zero. If I'm at 45 degrees, uh, then uh, rapidity is 0 0.88. Um, if I go to 10 degrees, rapidity is 2.44. And if I look at, for example, the Atlas or CMS detectors, you know, their rough total rapidity coverage uh, is kind of bounded by five. And there's a lot of room between 2.44 and infinity. And there's just a ton of radiation that's happening uh, uh, in this direction. And again, that's just the dynamics of QCD. You have to just deal with it. So one thing that's convenient to do when trying to, to, to visualize uh, collision events is uh, you imagine your detector. So this is why detectors are cylindrical. 
uh, these, these cylindrical detectors as opposed to spherical detectors are because you want to try to segment your detector kind of uni uniformly in this, this eta in order to have uniform uh, uh, QCD radiation going into your detector. Um, and so uh, left and right corresponds to this rapidity. Uh, going around the axis corresponds to phi. And what's really convenient for just trying to make pictures is um, you can uh, take your scissors and cut open your detector, lay it flat, and then you can make a picture of, um, uh, of a collision process. You can make a picture of a collision process that fits on a, um, on a blackboard. So, um, so this is going to be my azimuth going around. So my scissors here are cutting along this axis. And that axis is the same as the axis over here. The uh, rapidities that I'm talking about um, are uh, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. And now I can try to look at a typical jet-like uh, production pattern. Um, and see what that looks like uh, in, this, in this plane. So in this picture, I would have, for example, proton, proton going in, and some spray of jets coming out. So I have jet one, let's say jet two coming out. And now I can see what this looks like. So the first thing that I have is I have proton, proton coming in. There's gluons and quarks inside the proton and proton. I have initial state radiation, which is you know, going down the beam line. And what that looks like in this plane is uniform emissions everywhere in this plane, uniform initial state radiation, roughly. And so every collision that you're trying to study at the LHC is bathed in QCD radiation, both from initial state radiation and from um, the beam remnants and underlying events, as well as pileup. This is a die jet event. So now I can ask where jet one goes. So jet one, I've put it at uh, a 90 degree angle. Um, so that's gonna be at rapidity um, of, of zero. So I have the center of my jet here. So here's my jet one. But there's QCD singularities, QCD singularities that are causing the radiation to go uh, in the collimated direction along with jet one. Um, because I haven't done a coordinate transformation, my coordinate transformation has made the ISR uniform, but it hasn't made the collimation here uniform. So I end up getting a spray of radiation dominated near the core of the jet and then dying out. And as we'll explain uh, more when we talk about jet algorithms, at the LHC, what we typically do is artificially draw a circle of radius r equals 0.4 in this coordinate system. And you can ask why it's a circle in a second. And uh, I call this, the radiation inside of this, a jet, despite the fact that this jet region is getting contaminated by all this ISR, and some of the final state radiation might go out of this cone region. My analysis strategy to try to capture this is by, in this case, drawing a circle and looking at the radiation that's uh, contained inside. Um, in this picture here, uh, there's a second jet. The second jet is going roughly back to back in terms of azimuth. And I put this roughly at rapidity minus one. So it's going to be roughly here. This is jet two. Final state radiation is collimated around it. Again, I could draw an analysis circle, but of course there could be radiation that extends out, so this is jet two. And then, you know, there might be some little dinky third jet here, which I have to decide whether I think it's a jet or not. You know, maybe I see some extra radiation that's maybe a little bit clustered here. Do I call that a jet or not? If I were to do my jet clustering algorithm, do I call this a third jet? I don't know. It's the choice of my analysis strategy. Is this a die-jet event, a three-jet event, a seven-jet event? Um, but the thing I want to emphasize is these collinear singularities. These collinear singularities tell you where the radiation is going. They're collimated along the direction of hard partons. And they're collimated with respect to the beam, which looks like uniform radiation in this rapidity azimuth plane.
What? Should it be a circle? Yeah, what shape do you think it should be? So, so you know, in this, I said I had rapidity in phi. And you can ask, do I really think that these jets should be circular? Should they be elongated? Should they be right, stretched out? OK, so here is, a, here is an amazing fact, um, which, well, not amazing. <laughs> here is a fact. <laughs> um, no, it, it, it's, it's only, it, the reason why I say it's amazing um, is that you know, lecturers like me will just tell you facts and say, this is the way we do it. You know, <laughs> and just trust me, <laughs> this is the way we're supposed to do things. And you're like, but why? And so now I've at least given you some intuition for why we use pseudo-rapidity. We use pseudo-rapidity because of the, 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 the initial state radiation patterns. And this is a convenient coordinate system for initial state radiation patterns. But now you could worry that this change of coordinates that I just did, uh, this change of coordinates, um, so it, it turns out that that formula that I had before uh, is equivalent to having um, that sine of this angle is equal to 1 over cosh of, of uh, rapidity or pseudo-rapidity. This is for massless particles. You could worry that the change of coordinates then distorts the shape of the jet in some way and that it actually is going to have some really funny shape when I do that coordinate transformation. And indeed, you should definitely worry about that. But here is a, uh, an interesting fact. So in my original coordinate system, in my original coordinates, so this would be spherical coordinates, um, open angles uh, are exactly what you remember from spherical coordinates. There's a d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. So that's in the original coordinate system. And in that system, that's the, that, that's the frame where it's easy to see rotational symmetry. And in this frame, if I, look at a, if I look at a jet, the jet roughly does have a symmetry such that the typical opening angle is more or less constant in this coordinate system. But now you can go to the um, rapidity azimuth coordinates. Um, So this d theta is the same. Oh, sorry, this d phi is the same. Oh, but I have the sine theta, but I told you that that coordinate transformation really looks like this. So this is 1 over um, uh, cosh squared y. And now you can ask, and this is something you can show, what is, when I do the coordinate transformation from theta to, to y, what happens here? And what happens here is that it just looks like this. So what this is saying is says that characteristic opening angles really are circles in the Wi-Fi plane. It's just that the size of the circle is like this conformal factor, if you want to think about it that way. The size of the circle changes depending on where you are. So if you have a jet of a fixed size here, when I go to the forward region, its size gets smaller but it's still a circular shape in that plane. And so this coordinate system remarkably satisfies two requirements. It, 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 it makes initial state radiation uniform, but also it maintains the rough azimuthal symmetry of final state radiation, so that the jet shape is not too distorted by this. It turns out that there's some subtleties where there actually is a slight distortion that one has to worry about, but at least at leading order for the small uh, angle limit, uh, this is an appropriate coordinate system to use. Okay, so we are um, uh, uh, coming towards the end of this lecture. <laughs> um, and um, let me postpone, uh, just so we don't get completely exhausted, let me postpone a discussion of jet algorithms um, until next time. And we're going to talk a lot more about jets and jet substructure in the last lecture. Um, but let me uh, end with... Um, just an important fact to keep in the back of your mind 
um, when we go forward. And this is relevant whether or not you're doing jet physics or anything else. Um, this is just a relevant uh, uh, fact about the structure of scattering amplitudes that, that I want to make sure that you know. Um, but before I do that, let me just pause to see if there's any further questions on what we've done. So the thing that I want to make sure that you have in the back of your mind, which you can sleep on tonight <laughs> before um, uh, the lecture tomorrow, is that when I'm going from Feynman diagrams to cross sections, that Feynman diagrams kind of fine grams Feynman <laughs> diagrams. Clearly, I'm not the only person who's exhausted by the end of this lecture. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Feynman diagrams. Uh, are a good approximation to inclusive um, cross sections. Or maybe I should add this kind of fixed order Feynman diagrams are a good approximation to inclusive cross sections. So if I draw the diagram we were doing for Higgs production, um, and I ask, what if I just calculated this diagram, did an integral over phase space, and this gives me some kind of cross section? Of course, this cross section is not the cross section that appears in the master formula. From the master formula, I get to dress everything up with describing it in terms of hadronic states. But if I just blindly did this calculation and calculated the Higgs, cross section. This diagram is a good approximation to the production of a Higgs plus anything. Where that anything might not have even appear in the diagram. So even if not in the diagram. So why? <laughs> this, so in particular, this cross-section, Higgs plus anything, like Higgs plus seven jets, there are not seven jets in this picture. But this cross-section is a good approximation to Higgs plus zero jet, plus one jet, plus two jet, plus three jet, plus four jet, plus five jet, plus six jet, plus seven, and so on. It's a good approximation to the production inclusive over everything else that might happen. So why is that? Why, why is it that when I calculate a diagram like this, I'm also kind of in the back of my mind uh, uh, keeping track of things that I'm not even keeping track of. Um, well, part of the reason is that, for example, when I have initial state radiation, initial state radiation, you might say, oh, there's a factor of alpha s, so this is suppressed. So this is perturbative. And you might think that this thing is suppressed. Oh, but wait, there's a collinear singularity. This thing is singular. And so there's not really a suppression here. That initial state radiation is just going to happen. And you might be worried, in fact, that because you have this initial state radiation, um, that this diagram is not a good approximation to anything. <laughs> that, that is, I, I might not be able to make any, have any predictive power, because any time I draw a diagram, I can just keep dressing it up with extra singular structures, and actually, I don't learn anything. Um, but, but here's kind of a fact that's useful. Um, and there's various ways of trying to understand it, which we can talk about in my office later. That when I have a process where I have an emission, and I do the appropriate integral over phase space, 
And if I include the interference diagram uh, between kind of the born process um, and a loop level process, this combination when I do the appropriate integrals over phase space is basically zero. And so while it's true that I have ISR here, and this ISR is large, if I were to calculate virtual diagrams, among other diagrams, then I would also get something that's large and singular. But their combination gives me something that's small or perturbative. So this would be, uh, uh, for example, you know, order alpha s and therefore, therefore suppressed. If I do a sufficiently inclusive calculation such that I include in my measurement not just things with born kinematics, but also things that include emissions, then this cancellation persists. And that's the reason why this is a good approximation to the inclusive cross-section. If I start to make restrictions on my phase space, if I start to restrict what things that I'm including, and if I start to get rid of this, then that cancellation doesn't persist, and I get large sensitivity. So if you say, for example, the words, I want to study uh, Higgs boson production plus nothing else, Naively, this Feynman diagram looks like it. looks like you made a Higgs and nothing else. But if you say, I want to study Higgs plus nothing else, then you're sensitive to singular behaviors. And perhaps counterintuitively, if, if instead you say, I want to study Higgs plus anything else, um, then you become, uh, uh, you get a cancellation of real emission diagrams uh, uh, and virtual diagrams. And that gives rise to uh, uh, suppressed singularities. So, Kind of from, from here on out, whenever you kind of are drawing a Feynman diagram, I want you to always be drawing that Feynman diagram and just remember, okay, when I'm drawing that Feynman diagram, I'm really imagining you know, arbitrary amounts of initial state radiation kind of coming off it as well. And if I do restrictions, that is if I'm not doing something that's sufficiently inclusive, then I end up being sensitive to the singular behavior that I thought I was controlling. I thought by restricting initial state radiation, I was getting rid of that singularity. No, it's exactly the opposite. If you want to get rid of that singular behavior, you need to be insensitive to or not be ma making measurements that are restricting that initial state radiation. OK, so I want you to keep that in your mind for next time. We'll see how, how that, that fact shows up. But now summarizing, I can now summarize the cartoon picture that you should have in your brain when you're thinking about QCD and collider physics. So the cartoon So we have, just again using the Higgs boson example, we have hard processes. We have hard scattering processes where, where a lot of momentum is transferred. And with the help of the narrow width approximation, we can say that this resonance that I'm pro being produced is approximately on shell. And so you have production and decay of roughly on-shell particles. And let's talk uh, about the production uh, and decay of the Higgs uh, going to, uh, to a bottom and an anti-bottom. Um, and so here we have the cross-section for Higgs. And here we have the branching ratio of Higgs to BB bar. And you know, that's appropriate to the extent that the Higgs is narrow. And you're making measurements uh, for which this is an appropriate question to ask. 
But for this hard process, we have to be mindful <laughs> that there are other things going on. Um, and in fact, let me uh, widen this uh, out a little bit just to make a little bit more room. So let me make. Uh, little distorted triangle. Yeah. We know that even though at this hard process level I'm slamming together gluons, really what's going on is I'm really slamming together protons. And I can use parton distribution functions to tell me, given a proton, how do I pluck uh, momentum uh, from that proton uh, in the form of a gluon uh, parton. But I can't ignore the fact that there's the rest of this proton around. And so there's the rest of the proton that could, in principle, collide with itself, and all sorts of crazy things could happen. And this is the part of the lecture that I've been sweeping under the rugs. And this thing here is called underlying event. And this is, in some sense, the dynamics of the non-perturbative uh, 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 remnants of the protons after the collision. And you should be worried. You should be worried. Wait a second. How do I know that there's not crosstalk between this underlying event and the gluon? Maybe this gluon actually exchanges uh, color with the underlying event. You should be very worried about that. And people who develop uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulation tools worry about possible crosstalk of this in the form of color reconnection. Um, so, but for sufficiently inclusive observables, the claim is that that doesn't matter. And you can ask whether that's actually true. So this is a non-perturbative dynamics. But we also have perturbative dynamics. Uh, we have initial state radiation that uniformly fills up this rapidity azimuth plane. We have uh, final state radiation that leads to the fact that we get uh, jet formation. So this is the physical phenomenon of jet formation, again, being driven by this collinear singularity. But we have to make an analysis choice depending on how we want to define our jets for the analysis in question. Plus this whole thing. <laughs> Uh, uh, undergoes non-perturbative hadronization. And so even though I'm drawing you know, B quarks and, and gluons being emitted, at the end of the day, what I see are color singlet hadrons. And the dynamics of that color singlet hadron formation, of course, depends uh, on the fact that we said earlier in this lecture, the fact that color strings break. And roughly speaking, this cartoon, despite this hadronization, is roughly right, that the way that jets form are largely insensitive to the details of that hadronization. And so the ingredient that we're going to have to, to introduce next time, and then we'll do a calculation, is that we need to use jet algorithms. So next time, we'll need to introduce jet algorithms um, to basically invert uh, final state radiation, such that I can invert this radiation pattern and jet algorithms are giving me access to, uh, so jet algorithms are, are giving me access to a proxy for the hard parton that I'm trying to study. So if I want to study the B quark coming from the Higgs decay, I can use jet algorithms to invert ISR, roughly speaking, and try to use that as a proxy. Uh, for uh, that part on in question. Um, but let me save that for, uh, for next time. OK, uh, further questions before we adjourn for the coffee break? OK, great. I look forward to taking any questions you might have this afternoon. And uh, thank you very much.